Welcome to a new edition of Focus. Our guest on the program tonight is Dr. Abdul Aziz Said, a professor of international relations at the American University and the head of the Global Peace Center. Yes. Good evening, sir, and welcome to our program. Good to be with you. It has been long since we were together. Right. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure well, to be here. Well, it's our pleasure to, uh, sir. Uh, uh, events um, uh, are all over the place, and uh, things are quite tight. Uh, during the past decade in particular, especially when the peace process started, everybody right. expected to just have uh, things at ease, uh, relax, but uh, on the contrary, things intensified uh, further. And uh, we feel that we have a problem with the United States, uh, mm -hmm. since you are a professor of international relations at an American University in Washington. You definitely have an idea about well, what is it uh, that the United States wants from us? Arabs. Well, we have been we have been out of touch with one another by we meaning the United States and Syria, mm. the United States and the Arab world. When I say out of touch, not out of touch in the sense of diplomatic communications that has happened, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about out of, out of touch culturally, civilizationally, out of touch in terms of people, in terms of institutions, in terms of organizations. And hence your question, what does the United States want? At any given time, a government, and you are referring to the U.S. government, because we ought to distinguish between government and people. Mm -hmm. At any given time, a government is interested in promoting its interests, uh, in representing its interests, in forging linkages uh, between one government and another. Mm -hmm. And your question is well taken, because when one reads, one looks at media, uh, in the United States, when one begins to analyze, one wonders what is it that is going on. And what is going on for me requires when, when people, countries, governments are out of touch, the, the antidote, mm -hmm. the remedy to that is active engagement. Mm -hmm. Active engagement to find out what it is that is involved. Certainly, Americans, leaving the government aside, uh, are very much uh, interested in, in exploring relationships because since September 11, there has been a tremendous amount of curiosity. For me, September 11 was a common tragedy. It was a tragedy for Americans. It was a tragedy for Arabs and Muslims, a common tragedy. And when we view it as a common tragedy, what it requires, in my mind, is a common response. Mm -hmm. Not a response that is not common to both sides. So what do they want? We have to find out. I mean, through active engagement, well, one side will find from the other side what's it that they want. Well, well, let's dwell on this particular point. It's a key point that you have just said, uh, active engagement. Now, when there's an engagement, there has to be not one party. There has to be at least two parties. Definitely. Yeah. Let's consider the Arabs to be one party and the United States to be another party. Who is to blame for, the, this, for, for a lack of an active engagement? Is it the Arabs who are trying very hard to, to understand what the United States wants, or the United States that has research centers and is expected to have real knowledge about this world, is expected to know the rights of those people, that they have been usurped, and there is a, there is a cancer which was planted in this part of the world that's consuming everything in their life, there has to be somebody, or, or you don't like to, to throw blames. Uh, uh, well, mm. in, my, in my business, what we learn, there's enough blame to go around. Mm. But your question is very important to focus on areas that need and deserve improvement. Certainly, what is needed are more exchanges. No question about that. More cultural exchanges for both sides, for Americans to have a better appreciation of, of the aspirations, of the needs, uh, of, of events in the region, and equally for Syrians and Arabs to also have a common appreciation. I think part of what is lacking, Yahya, uh, is we do not have a common perception of events. We do not have a common perception of needs. Your question, with notwithstanding the 
academic centers in the United States, research centers, how come Americans are not better informed? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, certainly academic, my center and many other centers, Brookings Institute, uh, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Center for International Strategic Studies, and centers, the, the, the Council for World Affairs, they do research, they make studies, and their studies become communicated to government apparatus, to government institutions. Sometimes their recommendations are carried out, sometimes they are not. Now the question becomes, what happens? Well, what happens at any given time in the US government, American foreign policy is really at best an attempt to reconcile between competing interests mm -hmm. domestically. Mm -hmm. uh, and hence, the wheel that squeaks the most gets the more attention. Yeah. And my judgment tells me that the Arab Syrian wheel should squeak more, meaning ought to be better understood more heard, more active. Mm -hmm. And that will make the changes. You are right. I mean, when recommendations, you are talking about issues, uh, what you have in your mind, some of the issue of Palestine and other issues in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, do Americans know about that? Sure, more Americans know more about the reality of the situation, but it has to be done more and more effectively. Well, uh, Professor Said, uh, in, in your in the first response, you talked about the inhomogeneity of the American uh, society, or the, that that uh, uh, not gap, but there is a government, there is an administration, and there is people. Definitely, yeah. And uh, we do not expect uh, their interests or their approaches to be uh, parallel or to be matching. Right. Now, these research centers direct their conclusions, their recommendations to the administration. Definitely. Now, most of the time, we see that these research centers, when it comes to the Arab-Israeli conflict, mm -hmm. they, they portray things in a way that harms the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And the, the research studies are quite clear before us. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, the Middle East Institute in, in Washington with the... With the Van, Van, uh, Van uh, and Indic. Washington Institute for East Policy. Washington Institute for East Policies. And then Ross, they make certain recommendations that would uh, um, make Israel look like somebody is, is uh, party threatened, and the other side is the terrorist uh, oh, that, that yeah. threatens yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Now, and, and this would, would influence the American uh, administration or the American foreign policy uh, to, to, towards taking a, a certain positions that would not harm. Mm -hmm. the side whose rights are usurped, yes. but would harm the interests of the United States yeah, yeah. also. Yeah. What, what you are saying, Yahya, uh, you mentioned the Washington Institute for East Policy. Definitely, they are pretty much promoting uh, interests that serve Israel. No question about mm -hmm. that. When it comes to mm -hmm. Arab-Israeli relationship, uh, they are powerful. Uh, they communicate the recommendations to members of Congress, to the federal bureaucracy, to media. Now we have other institutes, Middle East Institute, uh, the, the Arab American Institute. Uh, we have Brookings. Now, uh, Arab American Institute, yeah. let me just, uh, how much is it heard? Who listens to you? Even in, in, in that center. Oh, we are, yeah. we are, I mean, the, the Arab voice is not as loud, as visible, as heard as the voice that advocates Israeli interests. Mm -hmm. But Yahya, it has been improving in recent mm -hmm. years. Uh, ADC has more of a voice. But they are now about 30 years old, oh, yeah, those, well, those, yeah. those activities on those yeah, institutes. Well, but, uh, the, the but you see, part, part mm. of the issue there, uh, yeah, those institutes, meaning quote-unquote institutes that, that reflect upon, analyze, try to, to promote elementus, they also are a microcosm mm. reflecting differences within the Arab world. Mm. So that's that's the other issue too. I mean, you well, I, I, don't would, I wouldn't expect, for instance, Abdul Aziz Said to be uh, siding with Syria against uh, Iraq or Jordan to to yeah. to be some to, do to reflect <laughs> this, <laughs> some do. this. Let's confess it. Yeah, yeah. This some uh, this fr oh, fragmentation. Oh sure, some do because mm. when it comes to other than Palestine, the issue of Palestine, 
many of the Arab centers, Arab institutes have differing and sometimes competing. Mm. Now it's better mm. than before, no question about mm -hmm. that. How we all agree when it comes to, to building bridges mm. between the Arab world and the United States. We are all involved in bridge building. But to go back to your question, how come, how come what is needed really is more and more visibility, more and more representation in the United States of the Arab viewpoint through the establishment of cultural centers, through the establishment of information centers, through visits, through exchanges. We have to encourage that. Meaning the Arab cause, the Syrian cause, is not well represented. No question about it. It is underrepresented. And hence we have to encourage more and more representation throughout the United States. Well, it has to be well represented. Mm -hmm. Let's just go directly to the process of representation. Yes. Uh, a certain uh, researcher or even a politician mm -hmm. going from here to the United States, a certain center, mm -hmm. Uh, where uh, he would get uh, or she would get about uh, 300 in terms of audience. To what extent those 300 people have any voice when it comes to decision making regarding this region? They do. They do. I mean, you are right. One has to be selective. One has mm. to be selective. Uh, let me give an example. When I get to my office in the morning at the university mm. and I open my email, literally, Dr. Yahya, I have dozens of emails mm -hmm. from the Washington Institute for News Policy, dozens of emails from the Embassy of Israel, from Israel Information Center, from organizations that support or reflect upon or represent pro israel interest. I get minimal from other organizations. So that's, that's part of the issue. Sure, the, the Arab Institute is beginning to send emails. The ADC, the Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, is beginning mm -hmm. to do that. But comparatively speaking, it's minuscule compared to what we get from the others. Mm -hmm. So if I'm one professor getting that, mm -hmm. lecturing in my university, think of all the professors throughout the United States. So that's one side of it. Mm -hmm. So the emails that I get give me a perspective, a viewpoint that is, that advocates a position that is, that is pro Israel. As you fully understand, the United States, and you have lived there, you are educated there, the whole system of the United States is a system of multi multiple advocacies. Mm -hmm. And in the system of multiple advocacies, those who can advocate the most are those who are heard and who, who bring influence to bear on decision making. Your assessment is accurate. Uh, we Arab American organizations are trying to bring to 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 represent views that we think are accurate, that mm -hmm. we believe reflect the truth. But our ability to bring uh, to influence better than before, but still still way behind. We have to do much way more. behind. Way behind, yeah we well, are way behind. Uh, I mean we need for example uh, Syria should establish an information center. Mm. Well, we, we come uh, at the end to, to these uh, recommendations no. that if, if you have any, but uh, well, this puts for us your response that the in influence of this public towards Congress, towards decision making, and uh, this puts w within real context the conversation that went on between Perez and Shamir uh, and, and Sharon. Mm -hmm. Uh, one day Paris said to Sharon, uh, well, what you are doing just makes the United States mad at us. Uh -huh. It make turn the Congress against us. Uh -huh. And uh, the other one replied, Sharon, uh, well, you keep on telling me that the Americans uh, do this and do that. Don't worry. We control Congress and we, uh, nobody could say anything, could, nobody could be mad at us, nobody could be angry with us. Well, you know, Dr. Uh, there's no question that the Congress of the United States, be it the House or the Senate, uh, receives a great deal of pressure mm. from pro-Israeli elements in the United States. So there's no question about that. Sure, at any given time, you mm. can get out of, uh, uh, in the Congress, you can get 80, 90 percent 
mm. of members of Congress to sign legislation or agreements or what have you supporting Israel. Mm. I asked a question once of someone who knows Congress very well. Mm -hmm. How come these congressmen, uh, without, without much discrimination, will sign on to anything that supports Israel? His answer was very clear. He said, look here. For a congressman from Montana, take Montana, the state of Montana, mm. that does not have Jewish voters, it is not costly for him or for her to vote for anything that's for Israel. But it would be costly for him to vote against Israel. Mm. Why? Well, he said, why? Because in his constituency, his constituency is flooded by pro-Israeli information. Mm. Now, if you, he said, if Arabs, if Syrians were to not only, I mean, Syrians, Arabs invite New York Times, Washington Post, they're not going to change them. Washington Post, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, they're not going to change the way they think. Mm -hmm. Fine, invite them. But if you invite editors, writers, journalists from states, from Utah, from mm -hmm. Oklahoma, from Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, and then they go back and they write in the local papers about Syria, mm -hmm. the congressman and the senator from that state will be influenced by what they are saying mm -hmm. than the New York Times or the Washington mm -hmm. Post. So you are right, I'm not, it's not costly for a congressman to vote for Israel. But it seems that it's, it's more than uh, this relationship, more than this influence of, of, uh, of the media, more than the uh, activity of, uh, uh, of uh, Israelis in, in the United States to program uh, decision makers towards uh, pro-Israeli positions. It is, th there's a special oh, kind yeah, of relationship between the United States and Israel. And well, it seems that if it is, if yeah, relations yeah, are, right. if relations are a matter of, of yeah, interests, yeah, right. it's even beyond, b b more than that. W what sort of dimensions uh, are there related to making up this relationship? Don't forget, Dr. Yahya, that the American Jewish community historically and traditionally has been very much involved in the life, cultural life, artistic life, political life, intellectual life of the United States. So there's that presence, there's that heritage mm. that is there. Mm. And the average American has become convinced that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Mm. You keep hearing this over and over again. Mm. And people like myself keep saying, hey, wait a little, democracy for whom? How about the Palestinians? So to deal with that, you are right, it has become almost... Uh, a al given? Yeah, a given. It is, mm. it is uh, almost something totally accepted that this is mm. different. Mm. So part of it, that's why I'm talking, it's an uphill battle, I agree with you. It's not... It's not how how long would it, would it take us to just make things uh, not on equal footing with the others? but to at least make uh, an average American rethink mm -hmm. of those given statements yeah, about yeah. Uh, Israel uh, being, uh, yeah. s uh, believing yeah, yeah. inside that Israel is the only democracy when Israel is doing this, all the sorts of atrocities, yeah. breaking bones, occupying it's other yeah, people's land, all these it's things. It's beginning, for example, the first Intifada uh, made significant changes in the United States. The first, f for the first time, during the first Intifada, Americans, both Jews, Jewish Americans and non-Jewish Americans, for the first time discovered that Israel is an occupational power. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no notion. They had never thought that Israel is an occupying power. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? That happens because the first Intifada began as non-violent. And when Americans saw Israeli soldiers breaking hands and beating up children and women, uh, they said, hey, wait, that's, this is what's happening here. Mm. I mean, that was worth billions of dollars mm. in public relations for the Arabs. It, it certainly was. Uh, and beginning with then, you started seeing American Jewish organizations advocating peace. For example, uh, take Tikkun magazine of Michael Lerner. Mm -hmm. uh, take Harry Siegman, whom you read, and mm -hmm. he has been missing. 
uh, an American peace group began to emerge in favor of a just resolution, in favor of land for peace. Mm. So that had happened. Mm. Now, your question now, is it happening now? We are being to see that. For example, after September 11, myself and many others like myself, I've been invited by the Secretary of State, the Under Secretary of State, the Office of the Vice President, to be a member of committees. Mm -hmm. Of to develop this understanding. Oh, definitely. That's what, that's what, that's what mm -hmm. we are doing. Well, <laughs> Professor Saeed, uh, would I be wrong or would we be wrong, for instance, if we take the following decision, saying, for instance, well, for the past 50 years, the United States has been backing Israel, whether, whatever Israel does. Mm -hmm. We Arabs, 300 million people with all sorts of resources, active people, intelligent people, oil, uh, geography, uh -huh. the best in, in, in the globe. Uh -huh. Well, to hell with that. We want to turn our back and forget ab about the United States and turn our back and just cut this contact altogether. Would that help? No. <laughs> no because some people uh, think no, of no, that. I, know something I want you to, uh, to, to, no, no, to deal with I'm this being, question. I'm being, being mm. very straight with you. Mm. When, when I hear in Syria, Saudi Arabia, many people saying, we have done everything. Hey, wait a minute, you haven't done everything. There's a great deal that has not been done, that ought to be done. I fully appreciate, Dr. Yichai, the frustration. If I were here, I would feel very frustrated. I would give up. But looking at it from the outside, mm. having more or less a broader view, mm. sure, the Arab has earned all the frustration that he or she feels. The Arab surely has earned all the paranoia that they feel. Mm. But what I'm saying, leaving the game, so to speak, saying, no, the hell with you, we are not going to do it. There is no other game. By, by saying there's no other game, some of my friends were saying, look here, Abdelaziz, uh, I try to explain to them how to be players in the game. Mm -hmm. And the answer I get from many of them, damn the game. It's a crooked game. But then, crooked or not, it's the only game in town. Mm. And maybe by playing within the game, one can change the game. I, I'm a firm believer that the best change occurs from within the system, not from outside the system. And what I'm proposing is to do both. Change from within the system and from outside the system through alarm, through communication, through information, through representation, uh, through active engagement. That would do it. Mm. Well. Um, we are accused of just throwing the blame on others. Yeah, yeah. And uh, very few are the times when we just uh, 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 look into uh, yeah, ourselves yeah. and uh, find where we have gone wrong. Where have we gone wrong, sir? Uh, you know, Dr. Yahya, uh, unless a person accepts responsibility for, the, for where they are, they cannot move and right. change. Now, when I say accept responsibility, it doesn't mean uh, you accept the blame. It means, say, look here, I am responsible. I'm not saying that Syrians or Arabs are where they are because of their own fault, because of many factors, uh, because of much interaction. So to go back to your question, my first proposition, we have to accept whoever we are, Arabs or Americans, accept response for where we are. And once we accept that, because what that means, Bakriya, it means empowerment. There's a deep sense of disempowerment, of powerlessness. When a person is powerless and disempowered, he will say, look, it's not my responsibility. Now, having said that, rather than look at fault, how to assign blame, for me, my interest in my work is how to fix problems, mm -hmm. how to deal with problems. And these are the problems that are facing us, problems of communication, uh, of, of the interest, aspirations, true positions. There are certain people who say, well, we have to beg the United States in order to solve uh, the problems for us with the Israelis. And that is demeaning to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems that uh, we, we come to the conclusion, and I, I want you please to address this, sure, please. that even if we want peace, even if the United States wants peace, Israel doesn't seem to be in need for that or wanting that or determined to have that. There is a plan here 
in Israeli leaders' minds. Well, expose and that. Expose it. We by, have been doing it. And keep doing it because in public di diplomacy, one time to the voice has to become more and has become more and more visible. It has become louder. Certainly, I mean, and don't forget uh, what you refer to. That example was a reactive example. Hmm. What I'm talking about is a proactive example because many Americans believe it, Syria doesn't want peace. I believe and I know when people ask me, look, Syria has made its position clear. Two, they accept 242, they, they accept 338. Mm -hmm. The side also know that they cannot have peace with the Arabs unless Syria Syria buys on, unless Syria is involved. They know that. Now, to go back, mm -hmm. times have changed. We are dealing with the year 2002. We are mm -hmm. not dealing with poor. I have a feeling, mm -hmm. a personal analysis, mm -hmm. that if the Syrians become proactive, and address the Israeli public openly and clearly in a very mm. open way. And I think the government of Sharon could not withstand staying in power. It would collapse. Because the government of Sharon has convinced Sharon and his people are convinced, and they have convinced the Israeli people that Syria is the real interest. Mm. I really believe that. I mean, I, I may be making a dramatic say, but it is like how the Intifada made the first Intifada, the difference that it did. I really believe that. Now, I understand, yeah, having said that, this is a complicated situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand, but I'm talking about a process, mm -hmm. a strategy. Well, a process, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, this will not be done by Syria. I understand that. Yeah, yeah, because uh, uh, simply, yeah. Uh, the Israelis uh, who elected Sharon and, uh, and uh, who are patient with Sharon's uh, crimes and killing, etc., will not be influenced by any public diplomacy cry. Uh, they insist on, 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 on what they are doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. What's happening? If there's any silver lining to what has happened in the last few months, which is tragic, the, 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 the casualties are mm. unbelievable. Mm. But if there's any silver lining, uh, Sharon is losing credibility in Israel. Increasingly, Israelis are losing confidence in him. And increasingly, he has not been able to deliver. He came, he wanted to do, he has not been able to deliver. So he has lost credibility. He really has. Credibility. The situation has changed. Right, right. Because he, he promised them security yeah. and uh, yeah. other things, and what he's getting I mean, them I is hear killing. It. I hear it in Washington because we get visitors from all over coming, mm. reflecting on, analyzing. And what you keep hearing is that he has lost credibility. Yeah. Mm. So the situation now, at the end of March 2002, is very different from before. Would, they, would the, the U.S., would the Americans uh, realize one day that... Uh, uh, what happened, the tragedy that happened to them on the 11th of September uh, was a great benefit to Israel. Some, some people see that. Some mm. people see that, yeah. And it was, I call it a common tragedy. It yeah. was a tragedy for the United States, they realize, tragedy for the Arabs. Right. Did they realize, for instance, that Sharon took that as a pretext to do whatever he is doing? Oh, yeah, in the yeah. I mean, uh, that and also uh, the, whole, the whole war on terrorism, and they have mentioned that in, uh, in the United States. Mm. Uh, uh, some governments use it as a pretext right. also to quote-unquote clean their own houses. Mm. Well, let's, let's get your reading of, of where things are going with regard to the Arab-Israeli conflict. Do you foresee any uh, settlement or, let me put it in another way, or we shouldn't talk about this, or shouldn't worry about this, because this conflict doesn't seem to find an end. Yeah, no, no, no we should. We should, mm -hmm. <laughs> we should talk about it. And we what should, do you see? We, we what do should. you foresee? What, what I foresee, uh, of course, from the viewpoint of the United States, what you hear from the United States is that they want for the violence to stop, uh, for things to move. Uh, what I foresee is a reopening of the process. Uh, mm. As you know, in the United States, there is no reference anymore to a peace process as there was in the past. Mm. There's reference to negotiation. Mm -hmm. Yes, but there has to be a process. There has to be a process and identify the issues that have to be put on the table. I think it's going to happen. I really do. I really believe that's going to happen. I think what, what 
this the present situation has made very abund abundantly very clear is that violence is not going to resolve it that there is no military solution mm -hmm. and increasingly i believe their signs are beginning to understand that that there is no military solution i mean that the price is so heavy mm. the price is so heavy to both sides now it's not only the Palestinians who have been paying a high mm. price their sides have been paying a high price uh, professor that the price is unacceptable yeah. that the continuation of conflict in a violent manner is unacceptable mm. Well, I always ask the question to certain American politicians or diplomats or, uh, or uh, analysts, political analysts, uh, regarding uh, uh, pressure on Israel, yeah. uh, saying to them, well, the only way uh, that uh, things can be solved is through uh, pressuring Israel. And they say, well, they, they, they all do not like that term. And they feel that uh, pressuring Israel is uh, something uh, that's not part of the American policy. I think what's needed, mm -hmm. as someone who works with peace and conflict resolution, what is needed is for the Arabs to come with a plan. The Arabs have to come with, the, with a plan that they can agree upon. They have been coming with plans. Not really. Since they can't agree upon it. I mean, the plan of, uh, uh, of uh, one country is not accepted by a plan. I think what, what I see happening mm. as someone analyzing the situation, there's a sense of expectation on the part of the Arabs, and no, they have solved the problem. Uh -huh. That's what I'm by plan. Mm. They are more reactive. A plan like the meeting now in the, the coming meeting in summit, mm. a plan that this is our initiative, mm -hmm. uh, I bet you anything, that will be able to, to put the kind of pressure on the United States government. Mm -hmm. because. It has, a pressure has to be put on the U.S. government. It, it's a question of, again, the, the will that squeaks the most. Mm -hmm. But there has to be a plan agreed upon by the Arabs. Oh, sure, not mm -hmm. every Arab country will agree on the plan. Mauritania may not agree. But a plan that's agreed upon by, the, by Syria, mm -hmm. centrally Syria, that's very mm -hmm. important, mm -hmm. uh, by what I call the political Arabs and the financial Arabs. Mm -hmm. There are two kinds in my perspective. Mm -hmm. There are financial Arabs, mm -hmm. the Gulf, they are political Arabs. Mm -hmm. Of the political Arabs at this time, today, uh, Egypt is out of the game. Iraq is out of the game. So what's happening? Algeria is out of the game. So what this does, Syria is about the only political Arab state. By political, I mean those who wield political influence in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Now, the financial Arabs, the Gulf Arabs, you see, historically we have had financial Arabs, political Arabs. The political Arabs were Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Algeria, political states. Mm. Financial Arabs, Saudi Arabia, and you name it, Bahrain, not Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Kuwait, etc. Mm. But now what has happened, there's only one political Arab state that has that wheels, wheels influence in the Arab world, as well as vis-a-vis -vis the, the others. Mm -hmm. A plan that could be agreed upon by the financial Arabs and the, the financial Arabs to support it, the political Arabs to articulate it. I think that will wield a great deal of pressure. That will be a voice to be heard. In the absence of that, I don't think it will happen. I have heard from American diplomats who have retired, be it a Murphy, be it a Pelletro, be it mm -hmm. a Jerigian, you know them, mm -hmm. uh, who had become ambassadors, then become assistant secretary of state, then they retired. To the man and the woman, everyone tells me after they are looking, the challenge is for the Arabs to have a plan agreed upon mm. and to back it up with the United States. Okay, on this uh, futuristic, <laughs> optimistic note, we end this uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like uh, Professor uh, Abdelaziz Saeed. Uh, to thank you very much for you being with us and hope to see you again. Thank you. It's good to be with you, and I follow your efforts and your activities and I'm very proud of your contribution. Okay. Uh, and to our audience, thank you very much for your being with us. Hope to see you next week. Good night.